Quite a few questions have come into us from philipjensen.com. Here's one. I've been raised with infant baptism, but found very few people can explain why it is practiced or why it ought to be practiced. I would love some clear teaching on this issue. Well, here's a topic that'll take more than a quick soundbite. Bible believers have disagreed for centuries over this one, so I'm not about to solve it in a few minutes. But here are 10 quick points to start the grey cells twitching and the conversation starting. One, Bible believers disagree because the Bible is silent on the matter. Two, we must be careful, therefore, not to be overconfident on this topic. Three, if you are somebody who has this all worked out, it'd be better to go to another question and answer time because I'm only going to irritate you in the next few minutes. Four, there are several issues involved in this one question. One is the status of children of believers in the kingdom of heaven and how to express that kind of status that they have while we're still in this world. Certainly, we should bring children to Jesus, for if you remember, the Lord Jesus himself said, of such is the kingdom of God. Five, we need to remember that the symbol is never as important as the reality it symbolises. So, anybody can wear a university sweatshirt, but that doesn't mean they've enrolled at the university let alone studied at the university. Enrolment and study are two different things and the university sweatshirt generally means that your auntie was a tourist and didn't know what to buy you. Six, Western individualism is only partly true. It's partly true the Bible teaches individualism, but it's only partly true the Bible also has the collective mindset and deals with families and nations. A child is an extension of its parents till it comes of age to take its own responsibilities. And whatever side of the fence we are in infant baptism, we have the same issues that are involved in individualism and collectivism. Those of us who are individualists have the same difficulty with the subject of the sin in Adam. To individualists, this is a very strange idea. But if you see yourself as part of something bigger, that is the family or the family of humanity, well then, it's not such a problem. Seven. Another issue is the relationship of the reality and the symbol. That is, many parents either baptise or dedicate their babies and then wait for the child to grow up into maturity and then they'll either confirm them if they baptise them as babies or they'll baptise them if they dedicated them as babies, depending on what they did. It all means much the same thing, the reality but the symbol is applied at a different point. Both systems require making up something that's not in the Bible, either the confirmation service, which is nowhere in the Bible, or the dedication service, which is nowhere in the Bible, because both systems speak of the same reality. As a child, the child as a baby is the responsibility of the parents. As a young adult, they have to take responsibility for themselves. Eight, there are a variety of realities that people think baptism symbolises. Some think it's regeneration. Others think it's belief or faith. Others think it's a covenant membership and still others think it's repentance. Personally, I think repentance has the best claim. It's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But what you then do with this baptism is really determined by what you believe it symbolises. So that's the ninth point. What you think it symbolises determines whether you can or cannot baptise babies. If baptism symbolises the faith that you are professing for the church, well then of course you can't baptise babies. If it symbolises the covenant membership and acceptance of the child as a part of the family of God, then of course you could. Ten, is it possible to repent on behalf of somebody else. For as I said, I think baptism is a symbol of repentance. So could you do that for somebody else? Well, remember in Mark 2, where the man is let down through the roof and it says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the man, my son, your sins are forgiven you. Or remember in 1 John 5, where it talks about praying for the sin that doesn't lead to death, but you're praying for somebody else that you see sinning. And who better than parents to pray for the child 
that is inheriting the parent's sin and cannot yet pray for their own forgiveness. Well, those 10 points are only the tip of the iceberg. Or to change my metaphors, they're just more dust in the air. It sounds like we better do a longer session on this. Maybe we should put a chat room onto it. <laughs>